911, what's your emergency? Okay, stay on the line for the emergency dispatcher. Emergency dispatcher, what's the address or location of the emergency? They're right in the intersection. And what are you reporting? I have no idea. We're just, we just... Uh, All units responding, Colvin Speedway, we have reported a rollover, Northeast Quad. Rescue to rescue. It's gonna be painful to breathe, bud. Hold on, hold on, man. I, we, gotta, we, we gotta look. All right, guys, so who's gonna do airway? Okay, Dr. Smith. And Allison, you're gonna do the lines. And then, Michael, you're gonna put in the purple lines. Sure. Good. We have respiratory here. Right here. Respiratory here. Respiratory here. Respiratory here. Respiratory here. And who's gonna have pharmacy for pharmacy drugs and whatnot here? here? She complained of feeling dizzy or not feeling well. Kind of went out on her. 22 at the team. We defibrillated her one time. She went to a white complex tax. She looks like she's playing stops. She looks like she's back in it. Do you guys want to defibrillate her again before we move over? Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody clear out. Two FEs, one D50. Hold on. All right, hold on. Nobody's up. Everybody clear? Yes. Clear. Yes. Okay, Allison, you're good. Let's transfer. Let's transfer over and start continuing like compressions. Yeah. Continue compressions. Let's, let's verify the airway. When was the last FAR? Stop for just one minute. Check pulses, please. Pulses. I have pulses. I have pulses here. Okay. If you take a patient who's been in a car accident, which is by far the most common mechanism of being really hurt, and you go to a place where you're a trauma center versus a place that's not, you're, you have a better chance of survival, and that's been scientifically shown that your survival rate is increased by 25%. When was your last prenatal appointment and visit? A trauma center is the last place most people would ever expect to find themselves. Yet trauma injuries will affect one out of every three people. More people under the age of 44 will die from trauma injuries than heart disease, AIDS, and cancer combined. Not great odds, but better than they once were. The trauma centers, it's a fairly new concept. It hasn't been around in many ways, uh, you know, if you go back to the ancient times. Now, their doctors were there when you had wars and people were stabbed with swords and spears and things like that, but they weren't actually, actually a trauma surgeon per se. And if you look at modern medicine, uh, this is a relatively a new field. And to have doctors who are surgeons primarily ready to take care of people who are severely injured uh, is been around for maybe about 20, 30 years at the very most. Well, have I been in an accident? That's what it looks like. The changes in the evolving field of trauma care are mostly indistinguishable to the patients. Many have never even heard about trauma centers and assume they're being treated at the emergency room, or ER as it's commonly called. Depending on the hospital, many doctors and nurses will work in both the emergency department and the trauma center. However, the distinctions between the ER and a trauma center are numerous, specific, and significant. If you come into the hospital and you need to go to the emergency room and you have things like medical illnesses where they don't have to have surgery done such as asthma problems or heart attacks or strokes, then those will go to the emergency room and the emergency medicine physicians, uh, their expertise is to you know, stabilize you, triage you, and then get you to the appropriate specialist if needed. The emergency room is a vital aspect of trauma care and we work in the emergency room. But what we do is that we have a section of the emergency department which is specifically for severe trauma. And for that type of injuries, what we've done is we've put a surgeon in charge of those severely injured. If it's a life limb threatening, severe bleeding situation, if there's an airway, they're not breathing correctly, if they go unconscious, you need to go to the trauma center. If you cut your finger when you're cooking, you don't need to go to the trauma center. If you trip and fall and maybe break your ankle, you don't necessarily need a trauma center. A lot of emergency departments will have a surgeon on call, but they may have 30 minutes to an hour to respond to that. Ours, you have to be here in-house. We have to have neurosurgery. 
we have anesthesia in-house, the OR team has to be ready to go. And when was the last time you had and a trauma center is required to have specific types of equipment, rapid blood supply, rapid infusers, fluid warmers, and all of the resources. Again, it's the human resources that the trauma center is required to have that other emergency departments aren't required to have. I need to check your hips. Would you tell me this hurts when I move this relax your arm, your leg? There are thousands of emergency rooms nationwide, but only about 200 level one trauma centers, which provide the most comprehensive care available. They treat the same types of injuries and nearly all face the same challenges to provide that care. The University of Arizona Medical Center in Tucson is the only level one trauma center to serve all of Southern Arizona an area of more than 20,000 square miles that's home to nearly one and a half million people. Except for those who have been treated at one themselves, most people learn about trauma centers from the news. I thought it was the two units shooting at the Safeway. I, I know we have a caller who believes that Gabrielle Gifford was shot at the multiple victims. I was shot just seconds after the congresswoman. If I really start every ambulance we had out here. I was in a lot of pain, and I was very happy when I began to hear those boots on the ground rushing and jumping over us. I was told later that I was laying so still they thought I had died, and so they were rushing to the living. Four people down. I'm counting at least ten. A lot more units over here. I'd never ridden in an ambulance before, and I thought, I thought it would be a smoother ride. <laughs> I remember the radio conversation where they said, a 63-year-old woman to GSW, and I asked, what is a GSW? And they paused, there was a slight pause, and then he said kind of quietly, gunshot wound. I was in a lot of pain, and I was so incredibly grateful that I knew that I was now at a place where I was going to get taken care of. It's gone through my mind many times that the outcome for many of us would have been probably much different, certainly for the Congresswoman, if it had been somewhere where we would have had a long distance to travel. The everlasting effect of the January 8th incident, one of it has been that in the past, trauma systems it has not been as uh, well orchestrated or as sophisticated as some of the other fields, for example, cancer, heart disease, and children's. We got a lot of media attention. I think that the media attention was uh, fabulous for our, our organization and also for my profession uh, nationwide because we had an opportunity to explain to people what we do. My update's going to be fairly short and I'm going to turn it over. But I would say at least once a month we have a mass casualty type event. And then we get a whole bunch of people coming to us at once. Like again, the pileups of the cars, those are the most common type of scenarios. I think the value of trauma systems, I think we need to relate to any mass casualty. Um, we've had now the Boston Marathon incidents, bombings. They have nine trauma centers in their community to absorb hundreds of patients. We now have a bombing in Texas. There's always something happening. I think what people don't recognize is a lot of these communities have trauma centers and that's where these people are going. You just don't know when something's going to happen and we take it for granted. It's the first responders on scene following set protocols who determine the severity of the injuries and whether the patient will be sent to a trauma center. If so, the protocols require communication with a hospital prior to or during transport. The paramedics, the people in the field who triage you out there and work with you and stabilize you, know through set criteria if he has been shot or stabbed from a chin to the knees, for example, uh, if, they have, if they have a missing arm, 
if they have three or two long bone fractures, that type of thing. In addition to the fact that physiologically you look bad, you're unconscious, you can't communicate, your blood pressure is falling because you're bleeding, your heart rate's really high because you're having problems breathing. Those are things that tell them, you know, check boxes, hey, this one is bad, I'm taking them to the trauma center. Good copy, go ahead. He was on a motorcycle. The patient has multi systems from a small dislocation, multiple uh, bone bone fractures. Based on the information they receive, trauma centers assign incoming patients a code that corresponds to their condition and severity of injuries. This enables the medical staff to have the right personnel and resources ready upon arrival. At University of Arizona Medical Center, green is for the least injured, white is for moderate injuries, and red is for the most severe cases. I have one line in. We're trying to get another. Uh, uh, there was a positive loss of contest. Doesn't remember the event. His middle of his chest does hurt. Good copy. We'll see uh, rescue 70 in uh, 10 minutes. We contact for changes. University clinic. He's got multiple long bone fractures. He's got chest, mid like sternal chest pain. Techie 166. Yeah. Red? I call him red. Yeah, BP 140 over 110. Significant ejection from birth? What does that mean? He went far? Probably. I'm in a red. I'm in a red. What's your number? They've got one line or campaign a second. I think the biggest misconception when I talk to people is all you take care of is criminals and gangbangers and um, people doing you know bad things. And I think they forget about really who are who are trauma patients and who make them up. They could be your brother, your sister your mother, your father. Hello, oh, this is Zane, 18 year old hey, male, Zane. involved in a motorcycle accident. I know rate of speed, the traveling speed in the area was about 25. Yeah, no, Positive loss of consciousness yeah. prior to arrival. He has multiple long bone fractures, dislocation. I was at work and I received a voicemail from an unknown number. We have a dislocation of the uh, left lower extremity of the knee. A woman who came to the accident, and luckily she had a medical background. And so her message to me was very calm. She just said that he had been in an accident and that he was going to be going to the UMC Trauma Center and that I should go there. Do you take any medication? I'm allergic to penicillin. Allergic to penicillin, okay. Have you ever had surgery? No. All right. He was talking when he came in. He was completely alert and oriented and then quickly you know, decompensated. So we were able to get a little information from him, but also watching, you know, with the extensive injuries that we could actually see without even having to scan him or x-ray him, we knew that he, he needed to be innovated right away. Good color change. All right, let's get the x-ray in there. Let's get the x-ray in there. Well, my husband was there, so I just went and sat with him and said, okay, and he goes, it's far worse than she told you. Okay, back on three. One, two, three. We weren't there that long. And um, we were taken into a small room, and it was with two doctors, and they explained the level of his injuries. And then they said we could see him. Third unit of blood starting. We've discovered mostly orthopedic injuries, so significant orthopedic injuries, multiple fractures, both upper extremity as well as um, lower extremity, on the lower extremity, the left side, worse than the right. But, and we're also concerned about a vascular injury, an ar arterial injury accompanying those fractures. So if the fractures are that bad, we're having trouble picking up his pulses in his foot. They tried to explain that there was going to be a vascular team that had to establish his left leg and if it could be saved or not. Um, because they couldn't get a pulse in that leg, so they had concerns about that. Because he's a kid, and I'm a parent. I have a 17-year-old at home. He's 18. And just as a parent, knowing what they must be going through, 
it's that's just tough. I didn't know if we were going to get to see him again because they were really honest about the fact that he might not survive surgery. Huh? Yeah. Hold on, just a second. Hold on. thing about trauma, it happens so suddenly, you're not prepared. I think sometimes if a person gets a cancer diagnosis, you have some time to prepare for how this diagnosis is going to impact your family. You're getting a call at a random hour that someone's injured and you all of a sudden you have to make a lot of decisions very, very quickly. And then the scope of that decision making, it becomes more immense as it goes on. The length of time spent in a trauma bay varies significantly. Patients leave in one of several ways. There's the operating room for surgery or perhaps a transfer to another specialty department in the hospital, such as the ICU or intensive care unit. The lucky ones leave under their own power, but some trauma victims don't. Nationwide, approximately 150,000 will die every year. One, two, three. To prevent that, trauma centers use their significant resources from the moment the patient first arrives. He's got a big heart. In our situation, we'll have a team of maybe about 12 people there waiting for you. If you come in and uh, you're sick and dying of trauma, then my role is to be the, uh, the maestro of the orchestra that's going to take place. Uh, it'll be a symphony. I have lots of people in that room working at once. We work as a team. We have respiratory therapists, physical therapy and rehab, speech therapists, occupational therapists, mobilizing these patients, pharmacists. We have pharmacists at the bedside. Um, there's complex antibiotics, pain management. It takes a lot of different people who do their special things. It takes housekeeping. When we get a mass casualty in here, I need a team to clean and turn over our rooms very rapidly so the next patient, that once we're stabilized and move one patient to the OR, the ICU, or we can downgrade them to another treatment room, I need that room immediately clean to get that next patient in. Um, they're a vital component that a lot of people don't think about. It's an orchestra. You know, you have your flute player and you have your drum player, the violin player. They all sound great independently. They do great work independently. But how beautiful does it sound when they're all like working together? Most importantly, the person who stays with the patient probably all the time throughout their whole stay in the hospital is the nurse. So the trauma nurse, I think, is a unique breed because they have to be a master of all systems because you don't know which system is actually injured. So they really have to be um, highly educated and highly trained. Yes, because you guys are going to be caged up for the weekend. It's been crowded. You know, some things are harder to leave behind than others. Um, my drive home, it's... It's about a 20 minute drive, you know, from uh, UMC to here. Um, so that's kind of like my uh, debriefing, decompression time. Come on, guys. Come on. I really do try to leave it before I walk in the door. There you are. And we've always had dogs. They just look at you when you come home. They could care less, you know, if a patient yelled at you or, you know, a drunk person tried to, you know, hit you. Or <laughs> they, they don't, they, they really don't care. So it kind of puts things in perspective. Patients just keep coming, and the, the very next patient deserves the best care from us that we can possibly give. And um, they have nothing to do with what just happened in the trauma bay next door. All righty, we're going to get you out of here. You know, it's such a stressful environment, and it just can go from zero to 100 in a nanosecond. We have to rely on each other back there in the trauma bay, and like you know, whoever I'm working with has to know that you know I have their back and vice versa, and that you know we just have to work in sync. Yeah, that's good. It's kind of like 
a bunch of siblings, you know, like, you know, we love each other. We can, you know, joke with each other and, you know, be mean to each other, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it's just, it's like a big family. I love my job. That didn't come out I love right. my job. That did not, that <laughs> I can't see myself doing anything else. In catastrophic situations, many patients are unable to communicate even the most basic information, including their name. Consequently, all incoming patients are given a pre-assigned trauma name that stays with them throughout their care. We got a 25-year-old male guy just driving approximately 35 miles an hour on a motorcycle, no riding gear whatsoever. He's got a full thickness laceration to the mean portion of the right side of his hand. One, two, three. You want to examine your back now? Well, all you do is hug yourself. You can help follow, right? Yeah, you want to hang my pressing? No. Right here. No. no. Two, three. three. We'll follow up your chest x-ray, make sure there is no trauma. You remember every single thing that happened. Uh -huh. Can you touch your chest with your uh, chin? Anything here at all? No. All right. There's water down my ear. Mm -hmm. I got to clean it out. There's no two ways about it. If I don't do it now, the doctor's going to want me to do it before he stitches it up. Okay. It's looking good. Uh, I should have worn a helmet. It's not your fault. Hey, Mitch. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing, buddy? I'm a boy. All right. Well, I'm Dr. Tang. So tell me what happened. Okay, um, I was coming around the blind corner. There's an SUV in my lane when I came around. And they're coming right at me. So I went off the road. And my, I lost control of the bike. And when I realized I had lost control, I dived off of it. Anything yes. hurting on the back? No, there's something here. Right between these two joints is hurting. But... I hear you. Okay. Oh, we're gonna wash this out, okay? Mm -hmm. It's gonna hurt a little bit. But just be tough, okay? So give us about 10 to 10 minutes. We'll get things washed up and cleaned up for you. Well, I was very fortunate. I was doing 40 miles an hour and I tucked and I rolled. But it could have been far, far worse. If I would have hit the asphalt, I would I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. So, wear a helmet. Hello, ma'am. Are you there with him? I'm right here, yes. Okay. Um, the overwhelming majority of trauma center visits begin with a three-digit phone call. Blood coming out of his ear. He's having an allergic reaction. I'm on a roof. My leg's broken. He must have shot himself. He's talking to her now, but she didn't reach. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, I'm going to pass out in the vehicle. The 911 operator determines what the problem is, whether it's a fire medical problem or a police problem. They determine where the call is. Can you spell that for me? Once they've determined that, they transfer the call. Okay, stay on the line for the emergency dispatcher. Do not hang up. The call goes to emergency dispatcher. How many vehicles are involved in the rollover? And as soon as they get a determination of, uh, you know, the severity of and what the problem is exactly, they'll dispatch the call. Battalion 1, EC2, engine 16, ladder 16, medic 9, medic 7, Speedway Boulevard and Colb Road. While they're talking on the phone, help is on the way. What else? Anything else? Any other information? What happened? That's the frustration, is that you want to help, you're here to help. Is she... No, 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 not that... All right, is she bleeding? But they're so caught up in their distress that they're not listening and not doing what you're trying to get them to do to help the family member or friend until units get on scene. Right, to the right of okay. Her. Okay, and we I do have know. units in route. They should be there very soon. Okay. The dispatcher can pick up pretty quickly on the fact that it's a trauma call and the severity of the call. Um, a rollover accident, for instance, uh, a shooting, uh, something along those lines. As soon as we hear some key words. He's choking. Okay, hold on. He's having trouble breathing and swallowing now, so you need a medic. Boom, a determination is made and the help is on the way. So a lot of times, and in most cases I would say, help is sent probably more quickly to a trauma call because it's more easily recognizable. I hear sirens. You hear the sirens already? Good. I can hear them now. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to stay on the phone with you till they're there with you, okay? Thanks, son. There are different ways to determine whether air support is needed. Sometimes we determine just based on the information we get. Secondly, we get calls from 
dispatch centers around the southeast region. And we have direct radio contact with field units who will just over the radio say we need a helicopter launched or a helicopter put on standby. We'll try to get an address or a local area and then we use whichever helicopter is the closest. You'll see there's these little white indicators, those tell you where the helicopters are and so we're looking for the closest helicopter. So we would let whoever just called us know that we needed Air Vac 24 on standby or launch because they're the closest helicopter. Then we call that helicopter and let them know. Mantenga la línea, te voy a conectar con la despachadora de emergencia, no cuelgue el teléfono. It does take a special kind of person. These are dedicated people. They really are. It's shift work, so you work nights, you work weekends, you work holidays. Uh, you're away from your family at times when a lot of people aren't. And is he having trouble swallowing? I don't know. He's, wrong. He's been vomiting. He's vomiting? All right, stay in the line. Let me get some help started, all right? To be successful here, I think most people compartmentalize pretty well. You know, I realize it's your emergency, not mine. My job is to stay calm, to stay in control and get you the help that you need. It's not my family member that's sick or hurt or something else. So my job is to step back a little and try and see the bigger picture to get you what you need. All right, we do have units in route. They should be there very soon, all right? You're welcome. Few of the calls end up with the patient at the trauma center, but the first responders attend to every call, day or night. I got you a wallet right here. You're all right, bud. Just lay still. Go, do you have your, your pad? We can get on scene within four minutes of a 911 call and another four minutes from that time have the patient in the, in the hospital. Yeah, Those that he had on can simply find a wallet ID or anything while we're moving on. Right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, partner. Keep, keep your hands down. Right. Cross your chest. Keep it right there for me. All right? Oh, you got it. Okay. I'd say the number one transport is uh, usually from assaults. There's a lot of assaults in the area, whether it just be uh, from a fist fight or whether there's penetrating trauma from a gunshot wound or stab wound. Um, it's very, very popular in this area. Rescue, I'll keep you guys here to help with uh, traffic and clean up and shock you real quick. We get trauma every shift. It's a very busy area. We run a lot of calls. There's a lot of traffic, a lot of violence. How are you? Alright. What happened? Hey, uh, he hit me with the uh, rock. You're saying it was this rock here, right ma'am? Yeah. That's one he hit you with? There was two of them. It's your ride right there, so... Uh, Rescue 8 is sending in a 48-year-old female, chief complaint of bleeding from her right ear, accompanied by multiple bumps from an assault, denies loss of consciousness. She'll be transported by meds 841 to University of Maine. We do run into a problem with a lot of our system abusers that continually use the 911 system for, for their drug refills, for their just checkups and whatnots, and we don't send those patients to the hospital of their choice. We go to the closest hospital for data collection so we can keep a close eye on them. Okay, what's going on today? You just shaking because you're off your drugs? Put your finger in here for me. And you said you haven't used any drugs today? No. Yeah, I have, I have. What did you use? Meth. Meth? What would you like to do today? To go to rehab, what's going on? Can you walk for us? Here, I'll help you out. I find that patients have a preference for what hospital a lot of times. Sometimes they've had a good experience at a hospital or a bad experience at another hospital. Meds Control Rescue Aid is sending in a 22 year old male with meds 840 to University of Maine. Sometimes it's related to a family member dying. Oh, my family member died at this hospital, so I don't want to go there. A family member was probably going to die at any hospital just happen to be at a hospital, but it creates a bad stigma for them, so they feel like it's a bad place, or it's, it just has a negative connotation for them. Trauma centers are categorized and verified by the American College of Surgeons, according to state and local standards. 
The categories range from one to four. Level one is the highest and provides the most comprehensive care, from injury prevention to rehabilitation. In addition to the staff or facilities available on site, one of the most important measures for surviving traumatic injuries is the clock. Time is, is of the essence for us. You can't get a person here fast enough. So we found the best results overall is when you have the, the trauma specialist in the hospital that's equipped to take care of those types of injuries waiting for you 24 7. His INR is 1.4 and his hemoglobin went from 15 to 12 so I think that's good. You can only bleed out so long. I mean there's a joke that the trauma surgeons will say you know eventually all bleeding will stop. I'm gonna give it two. You know the thing is you have to get the patient who is bleeding, who has a large open wound, you have to control that area. The only way you're really going to do it is definitive care and getting them to the right place that knows how to do it and they can do it within a, a time. If you don't, tissue dies. Do you want me to open it up? The body compensates only for so long and then you really just need it fixed, whatever is broken. The Golden Hour stemmed from long history. I think it was our Adams Collie at Shock Trauma Center who kind of coined that phrase. And when you look at that, they just wanted to theoretically define a time frame. But we almost call it the platinum 15 minute. We got them in from the field. That usually takes 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Now we have only another half hour when you're looking at that golden hour to really do what we need to do in the emergency department to identify the airway, the breathing, and the circulatory issues that can kill them in the next 30 minutes to 45 minutes, get them to the OR, and stabilize them. In a community without a trauma system, they'll go to the nearest ER, and then there would be a transport to a trauma center, and that moves you out of the golden hour. In the 1980s, Tucson was that type of community, without a trauma center. Within a few years, there were two. One at both TMC, Tucson Medical Center, and UAMC, the University of Arizona Medical Center the two largest hospitals in southern Arizona. The fact that both hospitals established trauma centers at that time was indicative of the emerging specialization and science of trauma care. Despite the novelty, the reality of finances became a factor as it is today. By the late 1990s, it was clear that the trauma system was losing a substantial amount of money. We talked a lot about this being a public good that was provided in a private marketplace. And so TMC and UMC commissioned a report in the late 1990s to look at the trauma system in southern Arizona and began a dialogue with local, state, um, government officials about how we might better fund the system. It was losing, TMC was losing 3.3 million dollars a year on about a thousand patients and that was unsustainable. In 2001 in the fall, UMC and TMC came to the council and said that they were having a difficult time financially and would the city please find some funds to help them. They were looking for immediate funding. And of course, uh, that was a difficulty for Tucson because cities uh, in Arizona don't usually provide health care. While I was still on the council, TMC, which incidentally is in my ward, Ward 2, closed their level one trauma care center. They, they just absolutely could not keep on. TMC exited the level one trauma business on July 1st of 2003. TMC is a standalone community hospital and every day, every year, we have to be, take a very careful look at every service that we provide and every activity that we do so that we can remain financially viable. There are difficult decisions that are made today. There were difficult decisions that were made 10 years ago. We are now in southern Arizona with six counties uh, with just one level one trauma center. You compare that to Phoenix that has six level one trauma centers. 
Tucson Medical Center remains the largest provider of emergency medical care in Southern Arizona. As its name implies, University of Arizona Medical Center has had an educational commitment since its inception in 1971. We take our mission as an academic medical center very seriously, and we think that by being a trauma center, we provide not only a service to the community, but also an opportunity for learning for the medical students and the residents in Arizona. And so it was important for us to keep the trauma center open because of those two different missions that we have that really no other facilities in Tucson have. Frankly, the costs of readiness require a certain level of volume. So you have to see enough trauma patients in order to make the costs make sense. Hurts here? Okay. We estimate that we spend about 20 to 25 million a year on what we call trauma readiness costs, which are the costs of having the physicians, the trained nurses, and all of the infrastructure here on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week to provide that care. That 20 to 25 million dollar number, it doesn't include the cost of all the care that's provided to the patient once they're here. Only 3% of the cost of the trauma center at UMC comes from private insurance. If they don't have insurance, then the hospital has to absorb that cost. So it's really essential that we find some ways to cover this. I think we need to educate the public that when they require emergency services, many people think of fire, police, first responders, that where are those first responders going to take you? They are gonna bring you here. I feel like we're a public servant, no different than firemen, no different than police officers and so on. And you need us to be here all the time and, and it shouldn't be a really a cash fee for service type of practice. One way or the other, that we need to have public support in order to make this go forward. Otherwise, we'll be back to the way it was when the system wasn't so good. And, and that only hurts the people of Tucson. Okay, well then I'm gonna go. So if we've decided we're not in the trauma care business, we can't afford the readiness, we don't want to absorb all this volume any longer, what happens is the playing field becomes equal in our region. So all injured patients would go to the closest emergency department airway breathing, circulation gets stabilized. A decision is then made, does this patient need to transfer to Phoenix? That transfer of over 100 miles takes the patients out of the golden hour and diminishes their chances for survival. But long distances and added transport time are daily realities to rural, non-level one trauma centers that provide critical, immediate care to their patients, many of whom are neighbors. I love working rural. I love taking care of people I know. People are so nervous, so afraid. They're hurting so bad. And then they land in this emergency room out in the middle of nowhere, and that makes them that much more afraid. And I love watching them understand that we know what we're doing and understand that we're going to take care of them and relax into it and let us just take care of them. And it's the best feeling ever. A lot of times people who are in the far outlying areas, if they're 25, 30 minutes out of town, they won't wait for an ambulance to get to them. They will just load a patient up in their back seat and they will come to town with that patient. Emergency department, this is Kelby, how may I help you? And so it was last night that it started, right, you said? We get gunshot wounds, stabbings. One thing that's a little more unique to hear is uh, farming accidents, ranching accidents, and, and those are the guys who don't call am the ambulance. They just show up at the door with a skill saw to the leg, hand amputation, things like that. We get a lot of just showing up at the door. My name's Julie, and I'm the nurse practitioner here today. Mrs. Kelby, she'll be our nurse. What's up, buddy? How you doing in here? How's the pain compared to what it was when you came in? Well, it was doing pretty good until he said. I would say for me, I transfer somebody probably almost every shift. An NIDDM patient with hypertension. He started having his chest pain intermittently last night, and it got worse around 2 o'clock this morning. And I just want to put him in to rule him out based on his history and his diabetes. We call and just say, I need to talk to a trauma surgeon, and they 
connect us right away. If we need to start any additional treatment here, then we're collaborating with the trauma surgeons before they go. No, I won't be sending you home. I'll let you know, okay? Okay, you bet. <laughs> We just get them stabilized with blood or fluids and pain control and get them in the air and to them as quickly as we can. It's about 40 minutes from here via the helicopter when they're on our pad. And so we try to do our best and get them out the door and to Tucson. After the fall, she was complaining of some hip pain. Okay. So the family took her into the cop between the ER at that time. Thanks, Brandon. We don't have no blood pressure cuff on right now, right? No blood pressure cuff. Remember, you're with Moses now, so you're in good hands, okay? Yes. All right. Then we got David over here on the side, so even better. Okay? Moses and David. Absolutely. And you got Angela around, too. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll find those suits later on, okay? One requirement of level one trauma centers is education. This can range from preventing injuries to training prospective doctors. Big poke here, sir. Because on before this rotation, I was really not considering a surgical specialty. Really, the breadth of uh, cases and patients that come in and all of the fast-paced critical decisions that need to be made, it's, uh, you have an idea of what it's like from stories and on the news, but you don't actually know what it's like. I actually started out wanting to do surgery, so this kind of helped me consolidate that I do want to do it. I like that you get to work with a lot of different people in you know all aspects of healthcare field as well as non. Raise this leg up for me. Lift it up off the bed. We're sort of told that you know there's all these different subspecialties and there's all these different fields that you go into, but what you end up finding out is it's all very much a blend. You know, it's a a team effort and at the end of the day you realize that you know you can't do this alone you know trying to do the best for your patient isn't necessarily what you can do for the patient it's who you can call in who you can get to help you so that you know that it's patient centered it's not physician centered This is what all of us do in a level one trauma center. We educate ourselves and we educate the public, we educate the community. This is called outreach and it's just part of our job. So first I just want to take a minute to talk about how important it is to identify the critical trauma patient. Um, as I you have to stay current and this is the way we do it. If you look at the data, the data shows that ultrasound is actually very good for helping us diagnose these injuries. The level ones are responsible for helping give that information to the people who are here. It is part of their license requirement as well that they stay current. I mean, we have to have people that are interested in changing the way we work and always looking for a better way to do it. It's an under-recognized recurrent part of trauma, at least one in five women in the ED. Three question, 20 second screen will solve most of the issues and I implore you, please ask the question. We know that four women are murdered every day in this country by husbands, boyfriends, or exes. The most important thing is to screen for the problem. There's a three question, 20 second screen. Basically asks, have you been hit? 
kicked, punched, slapped, or otherwise hurt by somebody you know within the last year? If so, whom? And is anybody making you feel unsafe? 20 seconds. Almost a quarter of them will have been to the emergency department six to ten times prior to the diagnosis being made. And another 20 percent will have had 11 emergency department visits before anybody figures out what's happening. So we have lots of chances to intervene that we're just plain missing. It's an honor to serve those who serve. And, uh, you know, uh, to be in this field where what we do for a living is, uh, is an honorable field and to get paid at it at the same time, we're very fortunate. So we try to make it as fun and enjoyable for them as we can. What about hypertonic saline in transit? There are probably more studies in the literature on hypertonic saline than there are anything else. Don't we need to prescribe that? Yes, you do, and I just did. <laughs> We have these types of meetings all the time. This is in addition to the academic meetings where we go and present our information and show what our data shows. And that's a huge aspect of what I do as a trauma medical director as well. I mean, I'm traveling two to three times every single month for these types of events. This is a very important part of what I do. How do you define our humor? Well, drunks aren't funny. People throwing up aren't funny. People, the doctors aren't funny. But people throwing up on doctors is hilarious. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have a good day. I think the other thing the trauma centers do is provide a lot of public education and public awareness. They you know, train you to be safer, be smarter, um, wear your seat belts, don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, and all of those messages. And we work with our policymakers as well as our community to prevent injuries. We have that responsibility. Every year, nearly 300,000 teenagers are seen in trauma centers nationally as a result of car crashes, often associated with alcohol or distracted driving. So as part of their injury prevention efforts, UAMC takes the trauma to the teens. At Tombstone High School in southeastern Arizona, UAMC assisted with this mock-up of a car crash that was presented by local first responders and students themselves. This mock car crash is something to just try to grab kids' attention. This time of year with prom and graduation can be the deadliest time of year for high school students with car accidents, and uh, we want them to just think about it beforehand. Come Me, myself, in that accident, I honestly felt like it was real because one second, me and the people, me and my friends in the car, we were all talking and everything, and then the next second, like, the crash happened and I'm out the window dead. Come on, guys, let's get it going. Come here, requesting one helicopter, two ambulances. Cover them up, we're gonna take the roof off, Michelle, and then we're gonna take the doors off, all right? All right. Ready. Ready. Personally, I'd take away the fact that your phone can wait. It's not that important. Nothing's more important than you getting from point A to point B safely. It's not that important. It can wait. Get this one out first. We'll get the last one out there. I haven't been able to. Yeah, I haven't been able to get a response. I think it's important for students to see this crash to realize that it does happen and it could happen to you. Maybe they could prevent it if they understand how dramatic and how it could change people's lives. All right, you guys ready? One, two, three. Do we have any family or friends in the ID? No, she was with some friends, but they've already been transferred. And that's what the whole event is for, is to try to get the kids to think before they get in the car with somebody who's been drinking or driving, think before they drink or drive, and uh, when they are in the car, think about that text message can wait, leave that phone alone. Perhaps due to the outreach done by UAMC and others, there were no teenage crash deaths in the region during this graduation season. But unfortunately, there was still trauma. Welcome. 
got three here. Yes, so seven. Like you call Tama, make sure they're in the room. You have a cap monitor? Thank you. She's on DEA currently. She's had a, a total of three milligrams. That'd be down to two. Uh, Multi system trauma. We kind of just scooped her and went. She's uh, had a sense of kidney. That was on the way. Uh, trigger of 83. One, two, three. Let's look in the belly seat to the flush. Oxygen. Uh, she was uh, agonal when we got to her. And then uh, lost her pulse, went into PA. She's been PA the whole time for us. How long has it been? She's an elderly lady who was uh, involved in a motor vehicle crash. And um, sounds like she had been without any vital signs, meaning blood pressure or heart rate for, you know, going on 30 minutes. Um, so essentially, when she came here, she was uh, dead on arrival. There are rare circumstances where we will continue the resuscitation process, and rarely we do bring patients back from the dead. Mm -hmm. But you know, by and large, that's not common, and by and large, that doesn't happen in someone her age, and who's been down for that long. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, the minute she arrived, we decided to uh, seize all further resuscitation process. A level one trauma center must provide the full range of care and healing its patients need. From the critical first moments through rehabilitation and discharge. Of all the services provided and technology used, the most essential component is the people who provide the care. The doctors, nurses, therapists, and specialists who assist the patient along every step of the journey. It's a costly and emotional process that can take years, weeks, or months as it did for motorcyclist Zane Cox. This is Zane, 18-year-old hey, male, Zane. in a motorcycle accident. We have a dislocation of the uh, left lower extremity at the knee. What's your blood starting? I ended up having three compound fractures through my right arm. I shattered my wrist. I had radial nerve damage from my elbow down. Um, I fractured my femur, my tibula. I dislocated my shoulder, I dislocated my knee, I broke some ribs, I collapsed a lung. Before this, I never broke bone, really. He had 15 units of blood given to him that first night in surgery. We only have 12 units in our body. There was a team of two trauma doctors that stayed with us through the entire process and kept us in communication. The vascular team and delivered us the good news that they didn't have to do anything, that, that it was just because of the lack of blood flow that they couldn't get a pulse in that leg so that they were going to be able to go forward and actually try and mend the leg. You could just tell whenever he came out to give us more news that they were going to keep, be able to keep going, that they were just like, because I'm like thinking, you guys have been at this for how long? How exhausted are you at this point? You know, because you, you kind of have a sense of this isn't easy. You know, you're what you're doing can't be easy. But they were just, you could tell, they were just like so excited about being able to keep going. We were in ICU for nine days. And to have the, the level of empathy and care they had, because this is what they do every day. You're just another patient. But I never felt like that, ever. <laughs> the bird walking. Check it. I still have a little bit of struggles. I mean, a little bit of pain, but not to what it was. I'm doing very well with physical therapy and healing in general. It's given me a really good outlook on life, to tell you the truth. There's no doubt in my mind he's alive today because of the care he received. And if we had been someplace else, that might not have happened. To know that they are here in our community and to know that they're available to us. And we just take it for granted until we need it.
Funding for this program was provided by Desert Program Partners. To order DVD copies of this and other productions from Arizona Public Media, call 1-800-841-5923. And you can learn more about this program at originals.azpm.org level 1.